Las Vegas in 1975, Xanadu Casino Appraisal. There have been at least 45 casinos in Las Vegas that were planned, some even with groundbreakings that were never opened. The Xanadu Hotel and Casino is one of them. In the mid-1970s, Xanadu's majority owner, Tandy McGinnis, wanted to build a 1,730-room international-class hotel and casino on the southwestern corner of Las Vegas Boulevard and Tropicana. Caesars Palace was the first themed resort on the Strip in 1966, and a decade later, Xanadu would be the first themed mega-resort. This card would greet guests in their room and be placed in public areas at the Aztec-style pyramid. The card read, In Xanadu did Kublai Khan a stately pleasure dome decree. These words were written near the end of the 18th century by the poet Samuel Taylor Coleridge. In Coleridge's mind, Xanadu was a dream place conjured by the benevolent conqueror of China, Kublai Khan. It was Kublai's Garden of Delight, and in the midst thereof, he created a sumptuous house of pleasure. We offer you Xanadu today, in the hope it will fulfill all of your dreams of pleasure and delight here with us in Las Vegas. The resort was designed by influential casino architect Martin Stern, who designed the first two mega resorts in Las Vegas, the Off Strip International in 1969, and the MGM Grand in 1973. David Schwartz said, it is no exaggeration to say that with the International, Stern set the pattern for Las Vegas Strip casino development for decades. Gary Kent submitted the appraisal and feasibility study on October 30th, 1975, with the following description and theme of Xanadu. Approaching the overwhelming Port Crescere, Attention is immediately focused upon the firefalls, cascading waters which nearly stretch across the site, penetrated by the red-orange licks of dancing flames. The firefalls and cascading water design are similar to what the Mirage had in 1989 with the water features and volcano. Upon entering the Xanadu, the soaring atrium, some 20 stories in height, capped by the shimmering essence of mirror and crystal above and down to the action and animation of the casino below dominates and envelops the viewer. The open atrium design was used in 1993 when the Luxor opened next door. A lush garden fantasy of pergolas and gazebos located on the atrium deck overlooks the casino, setting the tone for the Xanadu theme. Specialty restaurants such as a Mongolian barbecue, the Marco Polo, the Flaming Sword, Forbidden City, along with a seafood specialty restaurant with a giant aquarium wall complemented by a variety of cocktail lounges and bars located with the Garden of Xanadu and casino areas. Themes and moods such as Kashmir and Shangri-La are envisioned with a special intimacy utilizing such elements as magnificently gilded desert tents, soft cushions, and exotically costumed waitresses. The Taj Mahal Casino Resort in Atlantic City had an oriental exotic theme similar to the Xanadu theme, and the New Jersey Casino also built a 1,500-person showroom called the Xanadu Theater. The South Strip Mega Resort would also include a multi-purpose lounge, 3,000 person convention hall and meeting rooms along with indoor tennis courts. The Xanadu appraisal and feasibility study also gave a snapshot at what Las Vegas was like in the mid-1970s. In 1975, Las Vegas Boulevard still retained something of the feel of the dusty desert roadway it had been in the 1950s when small casinos visually dominated by their neon signage Language between golf courses and undeveloped land. The population of Clark County exploded in the 1950s and 60s with more than 100% growth each decade due to the explosion of strip resorts. But in the 1970s and 80s, the population growth was below 70% each decade. 
The population of Clark County in 1975 was estimated to be about 334,000, which is a 22% increase since 1970. There were six bus services in town, including Continental Trailways and Greyhound. There were seven airlines flying into Vegas, including TWA, and five commuter airlines. Air travel continued to grow since the late 1960s, with about 6 million passengers arriving and departing in 1974. Last year, there were about 40 million people using the airport. Ground travel dipped recently, but the decline in automobile traffic in 1974 is due primarily to the shortage of gasoline during the first three months of 1974. Union Pacific Railroad was the only train in town, and it was a freight line with no passenger service. The city included two bus lines, over 500 taxis, which includes limousines and tour vehicles, plus four major car rental agencies. There were nine high schools in 1975. Now there are 72 high schools. Las Vegas had eight modern hospitals, 150 churches with 35 denominations, six banks with 46 branches, three newspapers, 12 radio stations, five TV stations, 10 championship golf courses, and about 4,000 private, semi-private, and public swimming pools. In 1975, there was no state income tax like today, and the sales tax was 3.5%. Now the sales tax is about 8%. Here are the 21 resorts in the Strip Corridor that were considered competitors to Xanadu. MGM Grand was the newest casino, opening two years earlier in 1973. The Marina Hotel and Casino would open in 1975, and it would become the West Wing Tower for the new MGM Grand in 1993. The oldest resort on the Strip, the El Rancho Vegas, which opened in 1941, burned down in 1960, but the second oldest resort, the Frontier, was still open. The Flamingo Hilton, Tropicana, Frontier, and Stardust all had no towers yet. Circus Circus, Sahara, and Riviera had small towers, with the Riviera currently building a bigger tower. Seven of these casinos remain, while three of them have or will change their names. According to Bally's, the Tropicana renovation will begin within one to two years. The Las Vegas Hilton was the largest casino with about 2,100 rooms, while the MGM Grand is the other casino with over 2,000 rooms in 1975. In 1974, there were 18,000 hotel rooms in the Las Vegas area. Today, at the intersection of Las Vegas Boulevard and Tropicana, there are about 14,000 rooms and a total of 150,000 rooms in Las Vegas. The Royal Inn had the most expensive suites at $295, followed by the Riviera at $250. The Stardust had the cheapest rooms at $12 for a double room rate, and resort fees didn't exist back then. In 1974, the vacancy rate in Las Vegas was about 14%, while the national average was about 38%. The MGM Grand had almost four times more meeting room space than the next biggest resort convention facility. The gross gambling revenue was about $350 million on the Strip in 1974. For Clark County, it was about $700 million. Total spending on the Strip was about $650 million. In 1974, Baccarat had the highest revenue, then upper quartile craps. $1 slots had the most revenue per gaming device, then $0.25 cent slots, followed by $0.50 cent slots. From 1968 to 1975, many vacant properties along the Strip were sold, and the heavy purchase by Howard Hughes through Hughes Tool Company in 1968, 1969, and 70 has greatly limited the amount of available land on the Strip for development because Howard was buying land and keeping them vacant. Most of the Strip land purchased by Howard Hughes from 1968 to 1970 
was between $1.25 to $2 per square foot. Within the next five years in the early 1970s, the strip land was largely going for between $5 and $10 per square foot, or five times as much. Last year, the two-acre land that will be Project 63 at Harmon and Las Vegas Boulevard was sold for $80 million. The same two acres back in 1975 would go for less than $1 million. In 1972, the Hughes Tool Company became the Sumer Corporation. After Howard Hughes died in 1976, the Sumer Corporation sold the vacant strip land and casinos before developing their land in the western part of the Las Vegas Valley into the housing community called Summerlin, which is named after Howard's grandmother, Jean Summerlin. The Sumer Corporation was renamed to the Howard Hughes Company, which currently manages Summerlin. In January 1972, a 29-year-old named Steve Wynn and his partner bought 4.5 acres of strip land next to Caesars Palace along Flamingo Road from Howard Hughes for $1.1 million. Ten months later, Wynn sold the land to Caesars Palace for $2.26 million, giving Steve Wynn a $600,000 profit in 10 months. This 10-month land flip was the beginning of the Wynn Empire. Howard Hughes sold me the corner next to Caesars for a million dollars, a million, a million one hundred thousand dollars. Why? Why did he sell to you? He was famous for holding on to everything. It was a strange, narrow piece of property that had come into his ownership by means that no one quite understood. And it was in his name. I bought it from Howard Robards Hughes Jr., not the Hughes Tool Company. This strange, silly piece of property was purchased in his name. When, when the people that took over Hughes's operation, when he left town, tried to find out how it came into ownership by Hughes, right. neither he nor anybody else could answer the question. And he was mystified himself. And my banker, Perry Thomas, intervened and had Hughes sell me the piece of property because it wasn't next to anything that Hughes owned. And he lent me the million two to buy it, including $100,000 for interest then forced Caesars to buy it from him. I made a drawing of a casino next door to Caesars. They said, you'll never get approved. We'll stop you at the planning board. I said, we'll see. The vote was seven to nothing, and they bought the land. Ten months later, I sold it for two and a quarter million to Caesars Palace. I made my first million dollars. I was 29 years old, and I paid my tax. I had a partner, Abe Rosenberg, that owned a third who owned J&B Scotch, who had signed the note at the bank with me. And on my $600,000, I invested in the Golden Nugget and got control of the company. And that's been the size of my whole investment from day one, $600,000. $600,000. Made on a land deal with Hughes. In the 1970s, it was believed that a change in legalized gaming in surrounding states, such as California, would greatly affect the projections shown. Gaming experts feel, however, that it would take a substantial length of time for legalized gambling in surrounding states to drastically affect the Las Vegas gaming industry by reason of the heavy investment in hotel casino facilities in the Las Vegas area and the time it would require to develop an atmosphere similar to that found in the Las Vegas gaming tourist industry. In the appraisal report, Gary Kent said that the project would be a highly feasible venture if built and estimated the fair market value of Xanadu at $144 million. The Clark County Planning Commission gave a building permit in February 1976 for construction of the 23-story Xanadu Resort. The appraisal report assumed that the existing utilities could absorb the Xanadu project, but the county insisted that the Xanadu builders pay for the installation of a new sewer line that would accommodate their project and future expansion. Because of this demand by Clark County, construction never began. In 1978, Tandy McGinnis, the majority owner of the Xanadu project, again started applying for a county building permit, but never followed through on the permit process. By this time, the Xanadu project was no longer a novelty. The newspaper account of the postponement 
stuck the project with the often proposed prefix. The Xanadu was acquiring a reputation as a perennial also ran. On June 19, 1990, Excalibur opened with 4,032 rooms on the vacant property. Martin Stern's conception of casino design as elaborated in the Xanadu would flourish in many jurisdictions. The Xanadu was a prescient, though ill-starred fantasy. Xanadu was a 1975 preview of what would become the mega-themed resorts of the 1990s. Thank you.